Hi, everybody. I, too, am very, very interested in the way in which all of this brings us back to residential education. And my approach, my crazy, hyperbolic, extreme approach to the massive open online course is to make the MOOC feel all the world like a residential education and therefore actually translates immediately back to the classroom without any apples and oranges concessions. Uh, so what I want to do is um, I want to uh, toss out six propositions or dicta. Uh, let's just call them propositions. Opinionated dicta. Um, and uh, let's hope that it stirs discussion. Um, I grant you that what I'm going to describe is not m really easily mainstreamable. Uh, it doesn't scale at all, which is the point, actually. Uh, it scales in a MOOC. That's pretty, that's serious scaling, but it may not scale given your time and attention as educators. Um, somehow I've worked it out. Uh, and they, and I realized as I jotted down these six propositions that they all sound a little negative or maybe a lot negative. I just want you to know from the start, just stipulate that I'm actually a very positive guy. I'm very enthusiastic um, and very happy with um, my work the last four years in, uh, in MOOCs and in the last 20 years in online education. Okay, so I'll tell you what the six are and then I'll elaborate briefly. And then what I want to do after that is simply tick off the ways in which the MOOC that I have created, co-created with a lot of people, um, the way it realizes some of these goals, which is to be entirely, utterly responsive. Everyone in Modpo, which is the nickname of my MOOC, everyone gets responded to, typically within a few hours, mostly within a few minutes. Everyone, 10,000, 20,000, 40,000, everyone gets responded to by the community. And our goal is to make it clear that MOOCs need not be impersonal. That they need not be impersonal. Okay, so here are the six. One, beware the course fetish. Nobody laughed at that. Okay, we've got some work to do. Two, pedagogies plural. Three, the end of the lecture should really be the end of the lecture. Four, Form is only an extension of content. And that implies to the course itself. The form of the course needs to be exactly as open uh, and question provoking as the content. Just a really hard one. Five, the failure problem. This failure thing that we, you know, people who drop out and fail, the failure problem is a complete and total red herring. I'm sure everybody in the room agrees with that. Most people do. And then six, um, it's a little prosaic. Let's not lose sight of what's actually innovative about MOOCs. Okay, beware the course fetish. I'll just say quickly. Um, I, th I think MOOCs continue to have the potential to change the very idea of the course, of a course. To unmoor us from the semester, to uh, alleviate, to, to solve our addiction to credit. But the problem is in the last year or so, I think that our drooling for credit, our um, desire to align these things with what is commonly understood as a course has started to take over. And I'm finding that the very fetish that I think MOOCs liberated us from initially is starting to come back. These things should not look like courses. They should not smell like courses. They shouldn't taste like courses. They shouldn't feel like courses. And they really don't have to be courses. So let's get over courses. Pedagogy is plural, number two. So there are as many, truly, as many modes of online teaching as there are teachers of online courses. And there are as many approaches and modes and pedagogies of online courses as indeed there are courses. So if a teacher is teaching three courses, there are three pedagogies. The, this is true, of course, of traditional face-to-face -face teaching. Nobody would say, oh, well, um, this seminar over here is the same pedagogy as this 400-person lecture class. Yet 
our detractors certainly say that all MOOCs are, they, someone will tweet, MOOCs do this or MOOCs are this. How many of you have ever read and been your blood pressure raised by a tweet or a Facebook posting or some stupid online article about MOOCs? This is mostly about two or three years ago, right? That said MOOCs are as if there was one thing. But I think some of us, many of us have fallen back into that tendency to talk about how MOOCs need to go in this direction or MOOCs need to do this. And it's really important for the platform providers in the room, and there are at least three in the room that I see, the, the, the platform providers themselves, that we shouldn't be deducing ever a single pedagogy or even a mainstream pedagogy for what they first imagined MOOCs would be. We have to account for the outlying pedagogies, the pedagogies of the innovators who are actually going to make it very difficult to adapt the platforms to what they want to do. Uh, Anant and I over lunch were talking about how the, the latest phase of the teaching in the platform providers works really well with that middle 60% of faculty. I, I'm making that 60% up, let's say 40%. And the, the folks at the, f at the top 10 or 20% who were the ones who early adapted to this thing, they're the ones whom we need to listen to because they've actually come up with all kinds of innovations. Uh, it, w this is obvious what I'm about to say, but we cannot have the tail of the distribution channel wagging the dog of pedagogy and academic mission uh, just at a time when online pedagogies in plural are emerging. So we have to be careful not accidentally to consolidate and think of a MOOC pedagogy. Three, the end of the lecture should really be the end of the lecture. So here's the thing that I faced when I first got into MOOCs in 2012. They were coming around, the folks who were luring us into the MOOC space, were coming around talking about what seemed very much like 21st century education. And my first question to the folks who made this first presentation to me is why, why would this 21st century delivery mechanism wind up unintentionally reinforcing a 19th century pedagogy, namely the lecture? Down with the lecture. In fact, all the cool folks in this room who are interested in MOOCs probably think that's a good thing, down with the lecture. The lectures are not they're not good. They don't, people don't learn. They certainly don't learn from the 50-minute lecture. So if we're really committed to changing that, we need to figure out what to do about the lecture. We should get rid of all lectures. Most MOOCs are, let's face it, even the really groovy ones are dependent on the lecture. We have to figure out how to get rid of, in the platforms and elsewhere, how to get rid of the apparent centrality of the video. When I first designed my Coursera course, the term on the left side menu, the term that I had to link on, it said lectures. I don't let, I've ne in my MOOC, there are no lectures. I have no, I'm, this is the closest thing I come to a lecture. No lectures in my MOOC, none. Why does it say lectures? It says lectures because that was the, the starting assumption that all the stuff, the applications, the apps for the smartphones and the tablets are geared to the lecture. My 90-year-old father takes MOOCs, lots of MOOCs. And I was visiting him once and he said, um, well, I'm getting ready to do the, new le the next lecture. And I, he's taking my course. He doesn't like my course, by the way. <laughs> he likes all the others. He likes the guy from Princeton, et cetera, who just lectures on you know, 18th century France. And that's what my, and he, my dad falls asleep. And then he says, that was a good lecture. What did you learn? I don't know. He's a very smart man. <laughs> he's taking my course, and he's confused. Why is he confused? Because he's watching the lectures. But they're not lectures. They're discussions of poems he hasn't read because he didn't look to see where the poem is. Look. Lectures reinforce the very things that have brought us excitedly into this room to figure out what the next step is, right? The lecture is, I know you don't, I have you want, I stand, you sit, I talk, you listen, I have something to say, you don't have anything to say, I already got my education, you haven't gotten it yet, I'm an authority, you would like to be an authority. That divide, which divides the subject of learning and the object of learning, which divides the person who knows and the person who doesn't, 
which divides a couple of uh, pretty fancy universities, or maybe more than a couple, and the rest of the untutored world, just reinforces the gap between us that MOOCs are supposed to close. Which is why Shigeru, who's like a huge you know, icon for me because of the open courseware work he did, why he is now here saying, Let's go back to the model of residential education, where you can sit in a room, not configured like this, believe me, and talk to people who can come closer to you. And you can sit, and you don't have to wear a tie, and you can say things like, I don't know. When's the last time you had a MOOC where the lecture video said, I don't know? You guys talk about it. That's the mode that MOOCs rebelled against. So I can't, in good conscience, teach the material I have to teach by reproducing the old 19th century and early 20th century delivery mechanism, to me it's tyrannical, not liberatory. So a lot of the stuff, a lot of the happy BS about MOOCs is about how, and Shigeru's example of the kid who's coming to, who's now in the class of 2019 at MIT, that is a liberal liberatory story and it's totally true in the case of that young man. But if we're really interested in freeing people from the limitations that are geographical and based on resources and distance, all that cool stuff, if we are really interested in closing that gap, we can't be using a tyrannical form by telling them what they don't know and then quizzing them on it. Four, form is only an extension of, I just spilled on this laptop. The, I read my Freud. Wow. <laughs> Form is only an extension of content. Oh, look, he's coming. No, actually, there's, it's just that. I think we're okay. Yeah. Oh, no, it's good. <laughs> That's amazing. Form is only an extension of content. Content is only an extension of form. This is the weirdest thing I'm going to say to you. Because for a lot of you in the STEM fields, particularly, you're going to think this has no relevance to me. But I, I swear to you it has relevance, OK? This concept of form content integration applies to the design and development of these courses. All right. If the content you're teaching is open and dynamic and shifting and is subject to the participant's response to an interpretation than an been there, done that, filmed in 2013 MOOC full of lectures is not going, not only is it not going to be responsive to the needs and the iterative questions about how the course can go forward and how we can learn together in the community building, not only won't it be responsive, but it'll be depressing because people realize, wait, that guy has less hair than he used to. That guy is gray now because this was filmed when they first started up and he's saying the same things, still saying the same things. We have got to find the spaces inside the space, which I'm going to tick off at the end here for in my example, but you have your own examples. And I went to a session earlier where these kind of, the uh, kind of interactivity is possible. Anant and I were having a conversation about a cool new chat application. We need to start working on these things because if the content is open and if the content creates questions and the content is liberatory, then you don't want people to go to the site and realize that it's fixed and that somebody already thought of it completely and that their response is moot. Their response is simply a kind of educational routine hoops to jump through. So if the, if the material you present is, is subject to inter-animation and it is indeed about the way people respond to it, which is certainly true of modern poetry, then the form of the course itself needs to be open to being shaped by their response. And once it's clearly not, then people get depressed and upset and angry at the non-responsiveness. This is not less urgent because we're dealing with a large worldwide audience. Indeed, it is more urgent because of that. Open material, open content, physics where we don't know the answer, right? poetry where we still don't know, open material requires open format and open pedagogy. Okay, five. 
This failure problem is a complete red herring. Now how many, I bet everybody agrees so I can be really quick about this, right? The whole discussion about people who drop out and fail and don't complete is a red herring. How many of you agree with that? How many of you are concerned about completion rates, seriously? Okay. So let me just briefly respond to it. Um, one of my participants, Anita Salustro from Western Canada, from rural West, Western Canada, who's been in Modpo four years in a row. She's in, in it for the fourth time. She responded to a stupid NPR story a couple of years ago saying that, uh, you know, MOOCs uh, were never, are not a replacement for, they shouldn't replace classes and nobody takes them anyway, nobody finishes them. She wrote, many articles have criticized MOOCs for their high dropout rates. I'm a dropout, says Anita. I viewed all the lectures, took all the quizzes, but I didn't submit the essays. She didn't submit the essays, but she peer reviewed others' essays, by the way. Many thousands are like me, she says. I challenge anyone to tell me that I didn't learn as much as those who completed the course. Please stop painting MOOCs as a poor substitute for classroom teaching. And Mary R. Moore, who's from Cape Town, South Africa, wrote, so much of the focus is not on democratizing education, but on monetizing it or trying to measure success. Now here I'm a real outlier because I'm not interested in measuring success. Sorry. Or trying to measure success by looking at how many people pass the tests rather than whether or not a community was built. Whether participants felt they had learned something and wanted to learn more and what kind of learning is not quantifiable, but crowdsourced and creates a love for, in this case, poetry or literature or gaming theory, et cetera. Different criteria are called for. Uh, and finally, on that count, uh, one, one of the Modpo people tweeted the following against some article that complained about non-completion. I got four weeks of Modpo before I got busy with my life, but my brain is still working on it. I feel complete, no fail here. There are lots and lots of people who, for whom MOOCs are good because life gets in the way and they can't finish it. But in fact, they're part of the community. My goal in my course is to create the opportunity for an interpretive community. And failure and grading and quizzes are not gonna measure that in the least. Finally, before I get to, my, to tick off my ideas about interactivity, which are very particular, the last one is this. Let's not lose sight of what's actually innovative about MOOCs. Okay, what's innovative about MOOCs is obvious, and the, the, course, the platform providers will be the first ones to tell us this. This is not a radical statement. It's not the delivery mechanism. And it's actually not, not even the content that's delivered typically through fixed asynchronous presentations, such as lectures. Not at all, that's not what's innovative about MOOCs. That's actually, despite all the excitement about flipping the classroom, which I'm totally in favor of, it's still not innovative. It's kind of obvious once the internet came around that we would do that. That's not innovative. What's innovative about MOOCs are the ways in which learning communities, actual learning communities, actual communities of learners, of unprecedented size and diversity and regional diversity, generational diversity and other kinds of diversity come together and improvisationally, synchronously, I mean synchronous not at the moment but over the course of four or five or ten weeks, synchronously, improvisationally and collaboratively interact with each other and the materials to make something new that the MOOC should be responsible ethically and otherwise to capture, collect, and include in the next instance of the course. So how do you do that? It's not easy. So let me just describe uh, by way of conclusion here some of the things that I've been doing in the last four years that make Modpo, my MOOC, my favorite place to be, utterly, utterly interactive and responsive. Again, our goals. One, to be fully responsive to all participants, everyone. I see eyebrows raising, that's our goal. And two, to prove that MOOCs need not be impersonal, that they can be deeply personal experiences. All right, so what do we do? First, I mentioned the videos. They're filmed discussions, they're not lectures. 
and we encourage copycat video making. There's a guy sitting right there, Eric Weinstein, who's developed his own MOOC, who's a ModPo regular, who's a community TA, an educator. Immediately upon seeing our videos, he thought, I can do that, and he has gone out to film Copycat is a disrespectful word, but you know what I mean. To use our videos as a model to gather other people around and consider other poems and produce videos which we then put in the course. Right there. He did one recently, it's already in the course. So videos, no lectures, discussions. Webcasts, weekly live interactive webcasts with uh, Google Hangouts, lots of people. Uh, telephone calls coming in. We talk to people from all over the world. People come to a space at the University of Pennsylvania, which I'll tell you about in a second. Uh, my co-teachers are there. We have experts on teaching and learning there. Uh, and we, we, every week, we have a live, it is recorded, of course, put up as a recording. And then, in the off-season of the course, I segment those webcasts for perfect three to four minute nuggets and I implement them and put them back in the course so that over the years ModPo has become a site where you can watch people together work through these typical problems and it's an iterative process where we get fewer questions about that because people can go and actually watch people, their own people, non-teachers work through the problems. Videos, webcasts, weekly webcasts. Three, office hours. So uh, we have 11 teaching assistants and 50 community TAs, the, uh, about 50. The 11 teaching assistants each hold three office hours a week. This is what Anant and I were talking about. We're trying to find a synchronous way to do it. Right now, it's almost synchronous, but it's actually asynchronous discussion forums. So my, my um, I have one weekly hour, uh, not three. but. Um, my, uh, my office hour is Thursday morning, 6.30 to 7.30 Eastern time. So I get all the lawyers in the East Coast and then the cool Asian people who are up really late at night and in, in far away. And that is a great time and I spend an hour and all I do is I watch the asynchronous comments come in but I keep refreshing it and I, I have a conversation. Office hours, we're real. They know we're real and we're there. Discussion forums, the most important thing about my MOOC is the discussion forums. Any evaluation that I do of a course, of a, of a MOOC platform is how good is the discussion forum? How robust is the discussion forum? And we created a discussion subforum for each poem in the course. So each poem, you go to the forum and you can talk with your colleagues and your friends and co-teachers about that poem. So it's crucially important. Uh, teaching assistants I mentioned, they're all over the place. They're the same people that you see in the video discussions. They're in the webcasts. They go to meetups, which I'll talk about in a second. These are people that, they're young people, brilliant, typically grad students. The student, the participants know them, they enjoy them, and they like to go to their office hours. Community TAs, crucial. Recruit them, they're great. These are people who've been in my course two, three, or four years. We orient them, we train them. They are all over the place. They answer a lot of questions, including about how the platform works. Peer reviews. Our peer reviews of essays are ungraded. They're, uh, they're completely qualitative comments on essays. And they all get copied into the discussion forums. So it's not the case as it would typically be in the Coursera platform where uh, you write an essay and only others who write essays get to do peer reviews. That locks out the teachers, poets, veterans, people who took the course and don't want to write the essay again, and me, I can't do it. If I go in, I, it ruins the whole thing. There's some weird error that takes place. So what we do is we have all of the peer reviews copied to the discussion forums, and the discussion of participants' essays are very much like the discussion about everything else in the course. It feels very natural. Our goal is to have at least four responses to every essay, and typically there are nine or 10. And some of the essays provoke 20, 30, 40, 70, 100 comments. And then the writer typically will say, when I was a student at Ohio State, I hope there's not like big OSU fans out there, or whatever state, or whatever university with its two or 300 people in the room, I submitted a paper, a person I had never met, evaluated it, put a few check marks in, wrote a couple comments, and, and put a grade B plus on it. But when I came to your MOOC, I got 15 responses, ungraded qualitatively, and I've never really gotten such a response on my writing. Thank you very much. Meetups. We encourage meetups around the world. I recently was in Los Angeles, and then in New York, and 
Every time I travel, I meet up, but I also make sure that my TAs are able to do that. The meetups around the world are the best. They are the way this thing is going to work. Uh, guest poets. I bring in poets every other week or so into the discussion forums. They're just there. So you're discussing a poem, and then suddenly there's a poet. And it's not hard to do. It's just like, just like what you do in a, in a regular classroom. Mod Po Plus. So I developed a second parallel syllabus. So to encourage people who've taken the course the first time to come back the second, third, and fourth time, I say to them, well, you've taken the syllabus for four, and we're not going to expand it because it's already a lot of work. So we're creating a supplemental syllabus, and it's embedded in the same course. So many people are there for the second, third, or fourth time, but they're working on a supplemental syllabus with its own videos and so forth. And they're there in the same space as the rookies and novices, and they're able to be part of a conversation. So we intend to add to Modpo Plus infinitely, and it becomes the, go the place to go for a survey, I think, on modern and contemporary American poetry. And a couple more. We're developing a crowdsource close readings page. So every time anywhere in the world makes a little video close reading of one of our poems, we add it to this page, which is itself a parallel syllabus. So now you can see that Al and his TAs do not have the final word on Emily Dickinson's I Taste the Liquor Never Brewed, that poem. You can go and see several videos from people in uh, Sri Lanka and Tokyo sitting around in a coffee shop talking about the same poem. And you get the impression that this thing is an iterative, ongoing process. And finally, recently we created a teacher resource center. The entire syllabus is reproduced with a series of exercises and videos of teachers talking about how you teach that poem. So teachers are now using Modpo to learn how to teach the materials that are also in the same site. So their students are in the site and they are taking a look at the teacher videos and they can then prepare their lessons and go into class and, and teach the same poems. And we have this year brought on two graduate teaching fellows in Modpo and all they do is work with the teachers in the course. There are many other ways that any of these MOOCs can be uh, responsive and interactive. The only limit is, and I hope that during your Q&A you will ask about this, the only limit is time, <laughs> money, emphasis, focus, institutional support, a certain amount of craziness, devotion, all that stuff. If you're willing to put the time into it, you can make any of these MOOCs completely responsive. And, and that indeed should be the goal because at least if we have to, if we, what we shouldn't do, I'll say this to end, what we shouldn't do is develop platforms or institutions that exclude the people at the far left end, the crazies such as myself, who want to make this just like residential education only for tens of thousands of people. We shouldn't ex accidentally ex exclude those people, which is another way of saying don't exclude me, I guess. Um, thank you so much for putting up with my hyperbole. <laughs>